we're talking about self-discipline, we wonder what it means. First of all, it means complete control over both the body and the mind. Complete control. Oh, that doesn't mean changing your, uh, your, your mind or your body. It means controlling it. For instance, the great emotion of sex gets more people into trouble than all the other emotions combined. And yet it's the most creative, the most profound, and the most divine of all of the emotions. It's not the emotion that's the, that, that, that gets people into trouble. It's their lack of controlling it and directing it, transmuting it, which they would be readily able to do if they had self-discipline. So it is with other faculties of the body and the mind. It's not that you have to change completely, it's just that you have to be the master, you have to be in control, you have to recognize uh, the things that you must do in order to have sound health and peace of mind. It also means the development of daily habits by which the mind is kept busy in connection with the things and the circumstances that one desires and off the circumstances one does not desire. It means that you will not accept or submit to the influence of any circumstance or thing you do not desire. Nothing at all. Don't submit to it. You may have to tolerate it, you may have to recognize it's there, but you don't have to submit that, you don't have to let it conquer you, you don't have to admit that it's stronger than you are, but on the other hand you assert that you're stronger than it because you're not going to submit to it. And you can give your imagination a wide range of operation there as to what these things are that you're going to have to deal with, but you're not going to submit to them. I'm not going to mention, mention them, it might get too personal. It means that you will build a three-wall protection around yourself so no one will ever know all about you or what goes on in your mind. Isn't that an interesting thing? Would you want anybody in this world, anybody, to know all about you? No, no. Who would? If you're in your right mind, you wouldn't. Would you want anybody to know all that you think about him? <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't. <laughs> Well, there are a lot of people who just make the mistake of letting anybody that wants to know know everything that goes on in their mind. All you have to do is start them talking. You know, these people who start their mouths to working and then go off and leave them. <laughs> you know the type I'm talking about. They just get them started and believe me, you find out all about them, good and bad. J. Edgar Hoover, with whom I did some professional work on a great many occasions and still do at times, told me once that the fellow that, who he's investigating is the best help to him of all, of all, because he gets more information from the guy that he's tracing than from all other sources combined. I said, why? He says, well, because he talks too damn much. Yeah, that's what his exact reply. Um, tell me what a man fears, and I will tell you how to master him. The very minute you find out what anybody fears, you'll know exactly how to control him if you're foolish enough to want to control anybody on that basis. I don't want to control anybody on fear. Not at all. If I control anybody, I want it on the basis of what? Love. Of course. Of course. On no other basis. I wouldn't have any control over anybody on any other basis than that he wants to give me control of it. The average person talks too much for his own good. You've heard me speak of my invisible guides, and if you weren't in this philosophy, if you didn't understand metaphysics, you probably would say that was a very fantastic system that I worked out. But I'll assure you it's not a fantastic system. I'll assure you that it looks after all of my needs and all of my wants. I'll admit that uh, last week uh, I became a little bit careless, and the, the, the guide to sound physical health let me down for a day or two. But but I did something about it. I came to his rescue. I gave him a jab in the ribs and woke him up. And believe you, I've got more energy now than I've had since we started this course. So it's a good thing that I had that little cold because it made me a little bit more particular to uh, express gratitude to this uh, guide of sound physical health, not neglecting. Now, <clears throat> I fully realize that these guides are the creation of my own imagination. I, I'm not kidding myself or anybody else about that. But for all practical purposes, they, are, they represent real entities and real people. And each one is performing the exact duty that I assigned to him. And is doing it all the time. The first of these guides is the guide to physical sound health. Why do you suppose I put that as number one? Fine. What in the world could the mind do going around in a body that has to be supported by crutches all the time? 
good strong physical body is the temple of the mind uh, and uh, it has to be sound it has to be healthy there has to be plenty of energy there when you turn on the old enthusiasm button and if there's no energy if there's no energy there you can't uh, generate in something out of nothing you've got to have a store of energy and energy is physical it's physical in nature and it's also mental in nature but I don't know of anybody who can express uh, intense enthusiasm whose uh, body is a series of aches and pains. So the first duty to yourself is to your physical body, to see that it responds to all of your needs at all the times, does the thing that it was supposed to do, and uh, you need a little bit more help than just uh, what you can give uh, during the day because when you lay your body down, then uh, nature goes to work on it, give it a tune-up and a... Working over, and uh, you have to have this uh, trained entity called uh, the Guide to Sound Health to do that job, to supervise it, and to see that it's done properly. And then this number two, the Guide to Financial Prosperity. Why do you suppose I put that second in importance only? Do you know of anybody that can be of any great service to others without money? How long can you get along without money? No, you've got to have money. You've got to have a money consciousness. And this entity that you're building up here through this guide gives you a a money consciousness. My guide is so controlled, however, that he doesn't make money my God. I don't permit that. I don't permit myself to become greedy, to want an over amount for money, or to pay too much for the money that I get. I pay enough, but not too much. I know people who pay too much, who die too young. Because they put too much effort into accumulating money that they didn't need and couldn't use. The only purpose it could serve would be to uh, cause their uh, descendants to fight over it after they were passed on. Now, that's not going to happen to me. I want enough, but not too much. And this guide, it's his business to see that I stop when I get enough and that I don't want too much. Do you know this this money-getting business becomes a kind of a vicious circle? With a lot of people. It does. It becomes a vicious circle. You get in it and uh, you say, well, I'll make my first million and I'll quit. I remember the time when, when Bing Crosby announced to his brother, who was his manager, when they made the first $50,000, that was enough. And they're going to quit. Well, <laughs> got down to where they make over a million dollars every year. Now, they're still working harder than they ever did before. Struggling in a rat race. I don't, I'm not speaking in a derogatory Matter you understand of Bing. My Bing's a friend of mine, and I greatly admire him. But I'm speaking of all people in that category who pay too much for trying to get things that they don't need. Now, this is a philosophy dealing with economic success. But uh, success wouldn't consist in your destroying your life and dying too young, uh, too young because you tried to get too much of anything. <laughs> Stop when you get enough. Make better use of the things you have right now instead of trying to get a lot of more things that you're not going to make any use of at all. Oh, what a wonderful thing it is, that statement that comes out of the Bible. I, I won't translate it to verbatim, but the meaning of it is not too much, not too little of anything. Not too much, not too little. Just enough of everything. Want to learn what is enough, not too much. That's one of the blessings of this philosophy. It gives you a balanced life. You learn what is enough and what's uh, too much. Then the uh, next one is the most important, the guide to peace of mind. What good would it be to you if you had everything, if you owned uh, everything in the world and could collect a royalty from every person living if you didn't have peace of mind? What good would it be? Now... The reason I'm emphasizing these points along here, my friends, is that I've had the privilege of knowing intimately the most outstanding and the most successful and the richest men that this country has ever produced. I mean sleeping in their houses, eating with them, knowing their families and their wives and their children, and seeing what happened to their children after they died and passed on. I've seen all of that. And I know the importance of learning to live a balanced life so that you can have peace of mind as you go along and so that you can make your occupation or your daily labor whatever it is a game of, that you're getting joy out of not something to be abhorred and dreaded but a, a game if you please that you play as ardently as a man would play a game of golf or some other game that he loves 
I have always said that one of the sins of civilization consists in the fact that so few people are engaged in a labor of love, a thing that they like to do. Most people are doing things because they have to eat and sleep and have, have a, some clothes to wear. But when a man or a woman gets in a position where he or she can do the thing that is being done for the sake of love because they want to do it, I want to tell you they're really fortunate. And this philosophy leads to that very condition. But you'll never attain that position until you learn to maintain a positive mental attitude at least a major portion of your time. Out of all of those men that collaborated with me in the building of this philosophy, and they represented every outstanding success in every field, you might say, of that era. Out of all of those men, there was only one that I could say that even uh, vaguely approached having peace of mind along with his other successes. John Burroughs undoubtedly was the one that came nearest it. I would say the one that came next nearest to it was Mr. Edison. And I would place Mr. Carnegie as number three. And I'll tell you why he takes position number three. In the latter part of his uh, years, he uh, practically lost his mind trying to find ways and means of disgorging himself of his fortune and giving it away to where it would do no harm. It almost drove him crazy. His obsession, his major obsession in the latter part of his days was to get this philosophy well organized while he was living and into the hands of the people so it would provide them with the know-how by which they could acquire material things, including money, uh, without violating the rights of other people. That's what he wanted more than other, any, uh, anything else in the world. No, he did not. Mr. Carnegie died in 1919 before I had even translated this into a writing, before I'd written the first books on it. But he had checked with me and double-checked on 15 of the 17 principles. There are two people that I always regretted didn't live to see me in the day of my triumph after having seen me in the days of my discouragement and opposition. Those were my stepmother and my sponsor, Andrew Carnegie. It would have been a great joy to me in a quite enough compensation for a lifetime of effort if I had, could have <clears throat> displayed to those two wonderful people the results of their handiwork in manipulating me and directing me at a time when I needed direction. No, I'm not so sure that they're not standing looking over my shoulder now. You know, uh, there are times when I'm sure somebody is standing looking over my shoulder because I say and do things that uh, beyond my reasonable intelligence. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was not in my notes, and the lady brought it out for her question, but I have thought about it a great many times. And I have noticed in more so in recent years than ever that the things that I do which might be called brilliant and outstanding always are done by this man who is standing here looking over my shoulder. And always in the times of an emergency when I must make decisions important decisions, I can almost uh, feel that man telling me what decision to make. I can almost turn around and imagine he's standing there in person. There is an influence there. There's no two ways about it. I could not have, and this is as good a time as any for me to tell you this, I could never have done what has been done in connection with this philosophy if I had had nothing but the collaboration of those five or six hundred men that helped me. That wouldn't have been enough. I've had more than that, believe you me. And the reason I haven't said anything about it before is I just don't want to get in the position of having people feel that uh, I have been favored or that I have anything that anybody else can't have. My, my honest opinion is that I don't have anything that you can't have. I think that whatever source of inspiration I'm drawing upon, you can have that same source. It's just as available to you as it is to me. I believe that with all of my heart. And then the next one of these guides here, the... They are twins, the guides of hope and faith. Now, how far would you get in life if you didn't have that uh, eternal burning flame of hope and faith working in your soul? There wouldn't be anything worth working, worth living for, would there? So you have to have a system, a system for keeping your mind positive because there are things to destroy hope and faith, aren't there? People, circumstances, things that you can't control even that pop up in your life. And you've got to have a system to antidote those things and to offset them. Something that you can manipulate and draw upon. And I know of no better system than these uh, eight guides that I have adopted here. Because they work for me, I've, I've taught them to a great many other people for whom they work just as well as for me. And then the next two are also twins.
twins, the guides of a love and romance. I don't believe uh, that anything worthwhile could be accomplished unless a man or a woman romanticized uh, whatever you're doing. In other words, if you don't put some romance into whatever you're doing, you don't get any fun out of it. And certainly if there's no love in your heart, then you're not, uh, you're, you're not just quite a human being. The main difference between uh, the lower animals and the, hum- and the human being is that the human being is capable of expressing the emotion of love. It's a wonderful thing. It's a great thing. It's a great uh, builder of, of geniuses and of leaders. And it's a great uh, builder and maintainer of, ha- of sound health. To have had a great capacity to love has been to have the privilege of rubbing elbows with genius. There's no exception to that. It's absolutely true. And so the two guides, love and romance, in my life, their job is to uh, uh, keep me uh, friendly with what I'm doing in life and to keep me young in body and mind. And they do just that, believe you me. Well, not only keep me young in body and mind, but they keep me uh, enthusiastic, they keep me sold on what I'm doing, and they take the drudgery out of it. In other words, I don't have any such thing as hard work because I uh, don't work at anything. I play at everything I do. Everything I do is a labor of love. I recognize, of course, that before you get in a position where you can economically forget about earning a living, there's something that you have to think about that maybe takes a little of the pleasure out of work. But uh, if you watch yourself, you can develop a system that will make everything that you do, even washing dishes or digging ditches or anything else, you can make it a labor of love for the time being. When I go home, I help Annie Lou wash the dishes. I'm not because she couldn't do it, or, but uh, because I just want to feel that I'm not too good to help wash the dishes. And I get great joy out of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not above working in the garden, because if I didn't do it, Annie Lou would do it when I'm gone and deprive me of the pleasure. Look at the nice tan that I brought back with me and all that good health. Oh, it's a great thing to learn to be, to learn to live the simple life, to learn to be a human being instead of a stiff shirt or something else that you don't want to be, nobody wants to be. Love and romance, uh, learn to get that into your life and learn to have a system whereby that uh, habit of love and romance will express itself in everything you do. Then this last one, the guide to overall wisdom, his job is to, he's the controller or the controller of the other seven. His business is to keep them active, eternally engaged in your service, and also to adjust you to every circumstance of your life, pleasant or unpleasant, so that you benefit by that circumstance. I can truthfully tell you that nothing comes to my mill in life that isn't grist. I make grist out of everything that comes to my mill. And the more unpleasant things that come, the more grist I get out of them, because I doubly grind them to make sure they won't be anything else but grist. It's a wonderful thing to recognize when you come to recognize that no experience in life is ever lost, whether it's good or bad. No experience is ever lost at all if you will make the right adaptation of yourself to it. You can always profit by every experience in life if you have a system for doing it. Of course, if you just let your emotions run wild and you go down under the, you know, adulthood under these unpleasant experiences, you will attract more unpleasant experiences than you will pleasant ones. But you know, there's a peculiar thing about unpleasant circumstances. They're cowardly. And when you get to where you would say, come on over here, little fellow, I've got a set of harness right here. I'm going to put you to work. Uh, somehow or another, they find business around the corner, and they, they, they don't come your way so often when they know that you're going to put them to work. <laughs> Have you ever thought of that? If you fear unpleasant circumstances, they'll crowd down on you in flocks. They'll come in at the back door and the front door. They'll come in when you're not expecting, when you're unprepared to deal with them. I don't particularly invite unpleasant experiences, but if they are foolish enough to come my way, they'll find themselves, gro- find themselves ground up in my mill of life. I'll make grist out of them as sure as anything, uh, but I will not go down under them. Eternal vigilance is the price that one must pay to maintain a positive mental attitude because of these and other natural opposites of positive thinking. And here they are. First of all, your negative self constantly maneuvering for power over you. Did you know that there are entities working in your makeup all the time, constantly maneuvering to gain power over you on the negative side of life? And you have to be eternally on alert to see that those entities don't take you over. 
And then your accumulated fears and your doubts and your self-imposed limitations, you have to deal with them constantly, lest they get the upper hand, unless they become the dominating influence in your mind. And then the negative influence is near you, including people who are negative, the people that you work with closest, the people that you live with, maybe some of your own relatives that are negative. And if you don't watch, you'll be just like they are, because you respond in kind. It may be necessary for you to live in the same house with somebody who's negative, but it's not necessary for you to be negative just because you're in the house with somebody who is. I'll admit it'll be a little bit difficult for you to immunize yourself against that kind of an influence, but you can do it. I have done it. Mahatma Gandhi did it. Look what he did with immunizing himself against things he didn't want. And then uh, number three, the negative influence is near you, including people who are negative. And number four, perhaps uh, some in, inborn negative traits you brought over with you from birth. Now, these can be transmuted into positive traits too as soon as you ferret them out and find out what they are. I'm convinced that there are a lot of people who are born with natural traits of, uh, of a negative nature. In other words, they, you take a person who's born in, a, in an environment of poverty. For all of his relatives are poverty-stricken, all of the neighbors are poverty-stricken. He saw nothing but poverty, felt nothing but poverty, heard nothing but poverty talk. And that was the condition I was born in. And I know you can be born with that trait. And it was one of the most difficult things that I had to whip, was this inborn fear of poverty. And then the worries over the lack of money and the lack of progress in your business and profession or calling life. You can put in most of your time with worrying over the things, or you can transmute that state of mind over into working out ways and means of overcoming those worries. Think about the positive side instead of the negative side. Worrying over the negative side is not going to do anything except to get you in deeper and deeper and deeper. That's all it's going to do. And then the unrequited love and unbalanced emotional frustrations in your relations with the opposite sex. You don't have to let these unrequited love affairs destroy your balance of mind as so many people do. It's up to you to do something about it, to maintain a positive mental attitude and to recognize that your first duty is to yourself. To get control of yourself and to not allow anybody, emotionally or otherwise, to upset your equilibrium. Uh, the Creator didn't intend that, that should be done and you shouldn't let it be done. Then unsound health, either uh, real or imaginary. You can worry an awful lot about that, about the things that uh, you think might happen to you but never do, physically. You know, if it weren't for that, we call it in the materia medica, we call it hypochondria. That's a two-dollar and a half word with the doctors. Five dollars, yes, that used to be two dollars and a half. It's five dollars now. That's how, <laughs> and sometimes a lot more than five dollars. <laughs> Well, you can put in a novel out of time of becoming negative over that if you don't have a positive mental attitude towards your health. If you don't develop and build up a, a, a health consciousness, think in terms of health. And your mental attitude would have a tremendous uh, amount to do with what happens to your physical body. There's no doubt about that. You can try that out on any time you please when you think you're not feeling well, but let some good piece of news come along and how quickly you snap out of it. <laughs> and you had that experience. You weren't feeling so badly at all, but, uh, but what this good news uh, did away with the, the feeling that you had. And then uh, intolerance, the lack of an open mind on all subjects. Uh, how much uh, trouble that gives some people in maintaining a, a negative mental attitude. Then greed for more material possessions than you need. I've already made extensive comment on that. I'm talking now about the things that you, the prices that you have to pay, the things you have to conquer in order to have a positive mental attitude. Ignorance of the real extent of the power of your mind and its unlimited potentials for the attainment of anything you desire. Then lack of a definite major purpose and the lack of a definite philosophy by which to live and guide your life. You know, the vast majority of people have no philosophy to live by. Did you know that? No philosophy. They live by hook or crook, by chance by circumstance, and they're just like a dry leaf on the bosom of the wind. They go whichever the way the wind blows, and there's nothing they can do by it because they have no philosophy of life. No set of rules to go by. Trusting to luck and to misfortune. And generally, misfortune is the one that rules. You have to have a philosophy that you can live by. 
Now, there are many philosophies, fine philosophies that you can die by. I'm much more interested in one that you can live by, and that's what we're studying here in this. It's a philosophy that you can live by in such a way that the neighbors around you look upon you as something desirable. They feel happy to have you there. You feel happy to be there. You not only enjoy prosperity and contentment and peace of mind, but you reflect that in everybody that comes into contact with you. And that's the way that people should live. That's the kind of a mental attitude people should have to live by. And then, last but not least, the habit of allowing others to do your thinking for you. If you're going to do that, you'll never have a positive mental attitude because uh, you won't have your own mind. We were given a copy of our first uh, edition of Success Unlimited as you came in the door. And you'll see one of my contributions over on the middle, two inside middle pages, called A Challenge to Life. Uh, this uh, challenge to life is something that I want to call to your attention because that is my reaction to uh, one of the worst defeats that I've ever had in my entire career. I bring it to your attention because it gives you an idea of how I go about transmuting an unpleasant circumstance into something useful. Now, when this circumstance happened, I had uh, real reason to go out and fight, and I don't mean fight mentally or orally, I mean fight physically. If I had to settle the, uh, the business from behind pine trees with six shooters, it would have been justified under the circumstances. But instead of that, I elected to do something that would damage no one and that would benefit myself. I elected to uh, express myself through this essay, which says that uh, a challenge to life, which says life... Uh, you can't sub subdue me because I refuse to take your discipline too seriously. When you try to hurt me, I laugh, and the laughter knows no pain. I appreciate your joys wherever I find them. Your sorrows neither discourage nor frighten me, for there is laughter in my soul. Uh, temporary defeat does not uh, make me sad. I simply set music to the words of defeat and turn it into a song. Uh, your tears are not for me. I like laughter much better. And because I like it, I use it as a substitute for grief and sorrow and pain and disappointment. <coughs> Life, uh, you are a fickle trickster. Don't deny it. You slipped uh, this emotion of love into my heart so that you might uh, use it as a thorn with which to prick my soul. But I learned to dodge your trap with laughter. You try to lure me with the desire for gold. But I have fooled you by following the trail which leads to knowledge instead. You induce me to build beautiful friendships, uh, then <clears throat> convert my friends into enemies so you may harden my heart. But I sidestep your fickleness by laughing off your attempt and selecting new friends in my own way. Uh, you cause men to cheat me at trade so I will become distrustful. But I win again because I possess one precious asset which no man can steal. It is the power to think my own thoughts and to be myself. You threaten me with death, but to me death is nothing worse than a long, peaceful sleep, and sleep is the sweetest of human experiences, excepting laughter. Uh, you build a fire of hope in my heart, then sprinkle water on the flames, but I go you one better by rekindling the fire, and I laugh at you once more. Life, you are licked as far as I'm concerned. Because you have nothing with which to lure me away from laughter, and you are powerless to scare me into submission. To a life of laughter, then, I raise my cup of cheer. You. Uh, you may think it's easy to have that kind of an emotional reaction to an unpleasant experience where you've been damaged and hurt and injured by those who should have been loyal to you. This business of striking back at people who have injured you or tried to injure you is just a lack of self-discipline. You haven't really become acquainted with your own powers. There are your own ways and means of benefiting by those powers if you stoop and to the low level of trying to strike back at some person who has slandered you vilified you or cheated you in one way or another or even tried to do any of those things. Don't do it. Don't ever do it. Because you'll only lower yourself in the estimation of yourself and of your Creator. 
There's a better way, a better weapon that I'm trying to put into your hands with which you can defend yourself against all who would injure you. And if you will take my word for it and use the self-discipline based upon this lesson that we have tonight, and never allow anybody to drag you down to their level. You set the level on which you wish to deal with the people. And if they want to come up to your level, all right. If they don't, let them stay down on theirs. There's no sin in that. Set your own high level and stand your ground come what may. I have a better way of defending myself. I have a mind. I know what to do with that mind. And I never am without defense. Now... I haven't got that out of my system. <laughs> You'll go down to my lesson. But I did want you to get this, uh, uh, this idea. And when, I, when our editor chose this challenge to life out of some one of my books to publish in the first edition, <clears throat> I said, that's fine. And I want every one of the students to have a copy of the magazine because I want to tell them the story back of that essay. And you may be interested in knowing that that essay, that essay was largely responsible for the late Mahatma Gandhi becoming interested in my philosophy and having it published throughout India. That essay has already influenced millions of people and will in time be indirectly or directly of influence beneficially to millions of people who have not yet born. So the power, it's not the brilliance of the essay, it's the thought back of it. Don't you know that you react to these unpleasant things in life in such a way that life can't conquer you? that nobody can conquer you. And you've got laughter in your soul. I want to tell you, you're sitting very close to the plane on which the Creator acts Himself. When you've got laughter in your soul, it's a wonderful thing to have. A wonderful thing. Laughter. A laughter in the soul, laughter on the face. And I want to tell you, you'll never be without friends. You'll never be without opportunity. And you'll never be without a means of defending yourself against uh, people who do not know anything about laughter. I pause for silence while you may remember what I have said about laughter. Now, what a suggestion. That is suggestion to self through which, uh, through, dominate, uh, through which dominating thoughts and deeds are conveyed to the subconscious mind is the medium by which self-discipline becomes a habit. Now, the starting point in the development of self-discipline is definiteness of purpose. You'll notice that every one of these lessons, uh, come uh, what may, approach uh, them from whatever angle you choose, you can't get away from that term, definiteness of purpose. It just stands out like a sore thumb, and you can't get away from it. Uh, because it is the starting point of all achievement, of everything that you do, whether it's good or bad. You may be sure that it starts with definiteness of purpose. Now, the reason for repetition of an idea... Repetition of it is what, do you think? Why should you uh, uh, go over, uh, why should you write out your definite major purpose, for instance, and uh, memorize it and go over it as a ritual day in and day out? Why, do you, why should you do that? To get it into the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind gets into the habit of believing that which it hears often. And you can tell it a lie over and over again, and, the, and you'll finally get to where you don't know whether it's a lie or not, and the subconscious doesn't either. I know of people who have done just that thing. Now, obsessional desire is the dynamo that gives life and action to definiteness of purpose. Obsessional desire. An obsessional desire is a desire that... Uh, how, how do you make a desire obsessional in the first place? Let's get into that. That's right, by living with it in your mind, calling it into your mind and seeing the, uh, the physical manifestation of it out there somewhere in the, in the circumstances of your life. In other words, if you have an ob obsessional desire for enough money to buy a, a new Cadillac, let us say, and you're now driving a Ford or something less than a Ford, you, don't, uh, you want that nice new Cadillac, you don't have enough income to pay for it, you don't have enough money, what do you do? Well, the first thing you do, you go over to the Cadillac agency and get one of those nice new catalogs with all the models in it, and you turn the roll over and you pick out the model you want. And every time you get in that Ford and start down the street, just before you start off, you kick off the starter and then you shut your eyes for a few moments and you see yourself sitting on top of a nice new Cadillac. <laughs> and as she purrs down the street, as you give her the gas, you imagine right now that you already have, uh, you know you own this Cadillac, but you don't exactly have possession of it. But for the time being, you're there at the wheel of your Cadillac. Sounds silly, doesn't it? It may sound silly, but it is not silly.
I can assure you it's not silly. I talked myself into my first Rolls Royce that very way. Did I ever tell you about the, how I got my first Rolls Royce? Do you remember that? Yeah. My putting myself out on a limb one evening in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, saying that I was going to have it that before the week was over and I didn't have enough money in the bank to get it. My student, sitting right in that audience, who had the, exactly the same car that I described, even down to the wire, uh, the orange-colored wire wheels. And he called me at my hotel next morning and said, come on down and I have your car, Mr. Hill. And I went down there and he had it. He had the legal transfer made out. Had, and the keys he had ready to hand to me. All he wanted to show me was a, a little trick or two that you had to know about a Rolls Royce in order to get the best results out of it. He took me down Riverside Drive. We drove a little bit and he got out and shook hands with him and said, well, Mr. Hill, uh, I, I'm, I'm very happy to have had the privilege of letting you have this nice car. Wasn't that a wonderful thing for a man to do? Now, he hadn't said nothing had been said about price. He said, well, the price, you fix the price. I'll tell you what I paid for it. But he said, you need it worse than I do. I don't actually need it at all. But you do need it. And I want you to have it. Be careful what you set your heart upon through obsessional desire. For, for the subconscious mind goes to work on translating that desire into its material equivalent. Self-discipline cannot be attained overnight. It must be developed step by step by the formation of definite habits of thought and physical action. You must go through the motion of doing something about it. In other words, when Al Allen comes on the stage here, do you notice the chemical change that takes place in your mind while you're doing that? Of course you do, and I notice it. I feel it out there on the stage, 50 feet removed from you. I can feel the vibrations of it. But suppose that uh, you sat in your, just sat still in your seats and uh, you repeated those words in a monotone like I'm talking now and didn't uh, put some zump in your voice and wouldn't do you a bit of good in the world, would it? No, you will learn to become uh, enthusiastic by acting enthusiastically. That's definite. <clears throat> now, the reason I admonish you to be careful what you set your heart upon is this, if you follow the instructions laid down in this lesson, if you set your heart on anything and stand by that decision, you're going to get it. And be sure before you start a, uh, any obsessional desire about anything that the thing that you're desiring uh, is something that you will be willing to live with after you get it, him or her. <laughs> I thought you'd get a kick out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I know. I see, I, I see a lot of cackling around in this audience of people who are married, <laughs> who understand exactly what I'm talking about. What a marvelous thing it is to uh, demonstrate in your own mind uh, something that you desire above everything else, something that's hard to get, maybe, and then come to know after you've demonstrated that you want to live with it the rest of your life. Well, that's a marvelous thing. But be careful what you demonstrate before you start demonstrating. You may be interested in knowing that out of the 500 or more men that collaborated with me in building this philosophy, every one of them was immensely wealthy. I didn't pay any attention to any other kind. I was only after the ones that had made a big demonstration financially. I had no time to fool with the little boys. That wouldn't apply today, but it applied then. And you may be interested in knowing that every single solitary one of them had abundance of wealth, but they did not have peace of mind. They neglected in demonstrating their wealth to demonstrate along with it a, the circumstances of life through which they would not worship that wealth, through which they, it would not be a burden to them, through which they would have peace of mind in their relationships with their fellow men. They didn't learn that lesson. If those men could have had the, uh, the remarks that I made when I stepped on this stage for the first five minutes, if they could have had that lesson, Back in the early days before they came immensely wealthy, they would have learned how to balance themselves with this wealth so that it would not have affected them adversely. To me, the most pitiful sight in the world is to see an extremely rich man who doesn't have anything else but riches, but monetary riches. And there are a lot of them in this world. Uh, the next most pitiful thing is the boy or girl who has come into possession of uh, great riches without having earned them. Uh, your power of thought is the only thing over which you have complete unchallenged control. 
controlled by the power of will. In given human beings control over but one thing, the Creator must have chosen the most important of all things. Uh, this is a stupendous fact that merits your most profound consideration. If you give it this sort of consideration, you will discover for yourself the rich promises available to those who become master of their mind power through self-discipline. Self-discipline leads to sound physical health, and it leads to peace of mind through development of harmony within one's own mind. I don't believe that I could stand before an audience of my students, many of whom know my background, and all of whom will know my background before they're through working with me. I, co I couldn't stand up with a straight face and tell you that I have everything in this world that I need or can possibly use or can possibly wish for. I have it in abundance if I hadn't learned self-discipline because that's how I got it. There was a time when I had very much more money in the bank than I have in the various banks that I'm doing business with today. Very much more. But I, didn't, I wasn't as rich then as I am today. I'm very rich today because I have a balanced mind. I have no grudges. I have no worries. I have no fears. I have learned through self-discipline to balance my life, with, balance my books with life. I may not be uh, entirely at peace with the income tax men, <laughs> but there is a big boy up somewhere stands looking over my shoulder that I am at peace with all the time. And I wouldn't have been at peace with him if I hadn't have learned the art of self-discipline, of reacting to these unpleasantries of life in a positive way instead of a negative way. I don't know what I, I would do if somebody came up and hauled off and slapped my face real hard without any provocation. I don't know what I would do. I was still pretty human, I think. As apt as not, I would double up my fist, and if I was close enough to him, I probably would hit him right here in the solar plexus, and he would go down with a delta. No doubt I would do that. But if I had a few seconds to think about it, instead of doing that, I would pity him instead of hating him. Pitying him for being such a fool as to do a thing like that. Uh, a lot of things that I used to do the wrong way, I do the right way now. And because I've learned to do them the right way through self-discipline, I'm in position to be at peace with other people, to be at peace with the world, and more particularly at peace with myself and with my Creator. That's a wonderful thing to have. No matter what other kind of riches you have, if you're not at peace with yourself and with your fellow men and with those you work with, if you're not at peace with them, then you're not rich. You never will be rich until you learn through discipline to be at peace with all people, all races, all creeds. I have sitting here in this audience Catholics and Protestants, Jews and Gentiles, people of different colors, different races, why, to me, you're all the same color, you're all the same religion. I don't know the difference and don't want to know the difference, because in my mind there is no difference. <laughs> I've risen above this idea of letting petty things, such as racial differences, anger me or cause me to feel at the least out of step with my fellow man. I just won't let those things happen, and there was a time when they did happen. And you know one of the curses of this world in which we're living, and particularly of this uh, melting pot here in America, is that we haven't learned how to live with one another. We are in the process of learning. And when we are all indoctrinated with this philosophy, we'll have a better world here in the United States. And I hope it'll spread over into some of the other countries, too. Self-discipline enables one to keep the mind fixed on that which is wanted and off that which is not wanted. If they didn't do anything else but that, if that lesson, this lesson tonight didn't do anything else for you, except start you on a habit or a plan whereby you occupy your mind from here on out mostly with the things you desire and keep your mind off the things you don't desire. If you did nothing else but that. All the time and all the money that you spend in this course would be uh, paid back a thousand times over because you would experience a new birth, a new opportunity, a new life. If you just learn through self-discipline not to let your mind feed upon the things you don't want, upon the miseries, upon the disappointments, upon the people who injure you. Now... Uh, what I'm telling you uh, to do is, uh, it's much easier for me to tell you than it is for you to do it. I know that. I, I'm not unappreciative of it, of what a difficult thing it is to start in keeping your mind occupied with the money that you're going to have when you don't have any now. 
Now, I know that. How do I know it? Well, now, I'll tell you. You give a guess. I know all about it. That's right. That's right. I know what it is to be hungry. I know it is what it is to be without a home. I know what it is to be without friends. I know what it is to be ignorant and illiterate. I know all about that. And I know how difficult it is when you're illiterate and ignorant and poverty-stricken to think in terms of becoming an outstanding philosopher and spreading his influence throughout the world. I know all about that, but I did it. I'm speaking now in the past tense. I did it. And if I can conquer the things that I've conquered, I know that you can do a, an equally good job. But you'll have to take possession. You'll have to be the person in charge. Take possession of your own mind and keep it so busy, occupied with the things that you want, the things you want to do, the people that you like, that you have no time left to think about the things you don't want or the people you don't like. And speaking about people you don't like, had you ever thought of examining very carefully the people, and with, as near as you can without bias, the people you think you don't like, and to find, not to look for their faults, to justify your opinion of them. Don't do that. That's very easy. That's the natural thing. That's what the weakling would do. But a strong person will keep himself in subjection through self-discipline and he'll start in looking in the life of the person he doesn't like for some of the things that he does like. And if you look uh, fairly and squarely, you'll find some of those things in every human being. There is nobody so bad in this world but what he has some good in him. If you look for it, you'll find it. If you don't look for it, you'll not find it. I think one of the evils of this age in which we're living, maybe it's the evil of all ages, is that when we come into contact with other people, if they give us the slightest reason on earth for doing it, we not only look for all of their shortcomings, but we multiply those shortcomings and step them up into something bigger than they are. And that's a great discredit and disservice to the person who does it. Because you under-evaluate. You can under-evaluate your enemies to where they'll just destroy you. And you can uh, underestimate your opposition too. And you'll have opposition. You, uh, you'll always have it. Uh, but you can convert a lot of that opposition from enemies into friends if you adjust yourself and start to work on yourself first. Don't start to work on the other fellow to convert him over to your ways of thinking. Start working on yourself to become charitable, to become understanding, to become forgiving. And if a person does you an injury, an out-and-out -out injury, without a provocation, you have one of the grandest opportunities in the world to do what? You have a prerogative that he doesn't possess because he's, uh, he's lost the initiative. If a person injures you with or without provocation, he's lost the initiative and you have it. And what is that initiative? You have the prerogative right to forgive him and pity him, don't you? That's what you have. I want you to emphasize the three mental walls of protection against outside forces. Now, you heard me speak about those three mental walls on one occasion, but maybe I spoke only casually. And maybe the, I didn't make a definite uh, Im lasting impression upon you of the necessity of building up a, a way of immunizing yourself against uh, uh, outside influences that would disturb your uh, mental capacity or anger you or make you unhappy or make you afraid or take advantage of you in any way. I have this system and it works like a charm. Now, when you get out to where you have as many people knowing you all over the world as I do and as many l beloved friends clamoring for appointments and so forth as I have, you'll have to have a system of choosing how many of them you'll see and how many of them you won't. That, that just goes without saying. You'll have to have that. You don't, maybe you won't, don't in the beginning. I didn't in the beginning, but I do now. And I tell you, that I'd be uh, my, my, my friends, my beloved friends, the ones that I love all over the world, uh, they'd take up all of my time. If I didn't have a system, you know, I'd keep them from doing it. And I try to keep uh, most of them confined to dealing with me through my books. Then I can reach millions of them. But when they want to deal with me in person, then I have to have a system for telling how many can see me in a given length of time. And this system is this um, a series of three imaginary walls. And they're not so imaginary either. They're pretty real. That first one is a rather wide wall. It uh, extends way out from me, and it's uh, not too high, but it's high enough to stop anybody that wants to get over the wall and get to me with anything, unless I, uh, he gives me a very good reason for wanting to see him. Now, one of my students wouldn't, uh, they would never need to, well, uh, they have a, each one of them has a stepladder. They can go right over that wall and shove the tall. They don't even have to ask me. 
But uh, outsiders uh, who are not privileged as students would have to go over that wall and they'd have to uh, make contact in some sort of a formal way. They couldn't just ring or come in and ring my doorbell or my telephone because I don't have any name. My name's not listed in any telephone book. They'd have to go through some formality. Now, why, did I have, why do I have that wall? Why, do, uh, why don't I just leave it down and let everybody come to see me? Let everybody write to me and answer all the letters that I receive from all over the world. Why don't I do that, do you suppose? You may be interested in knowing that on one occasion I received five mail sacks full of letters. I couldn't even look at, them, uh, look at the outside of the letters, let alone open them. I didn't have secretaries enough to open the mail. And I'll say that thousands of them were never even opened. They came from all over this country. It's not quite so bad today, but the very moment I get a little publicity about something, letters come to me from all over the country. There's a write-up about me in uh, this uh, last issue of Printer's Inc., and I'm getting letters from people who knew me 35 and 38 years ago, right here in Chicago, who didn't know that I was here. So you have to have a system. Now, when they get over that first wall, they immediately come into contact with another wall that's not so big and not so commodious, and, but it's much higher, many times as high. And they can't go over that with any step ladder. Uh, I'll tell you, they, you students can do that, without, <laughs> even if you had a step ladder. But there is a way of your getting over it. And I'm going to tip you off what it is. If you have something I want, you can get over it very easily. <laughs> or if you have something in common with me, which is the mean thing. I don't mean to be, uh, make that statement selfishly. I want to clarify it. I mean by that, <clears throat> you can get over that uh, second wall and get to me very easily if... I am convinced that uh, the time I devote to you is going to be of mutual benefit to you and me both. But if it's just something that's going to benefit you and not me, the chances are that you won't make it. There are exceptions, but very, very few. And I'd use my judgment as to where the exceptions came. And there's nothing selfish about that. It's of necessity. I'll assure you it's of necessity. Then when you get over that second wall, you come in contact with one that's very much more narrow, and it's as high as eternity. No living person ever gets over that wall. Not even my wife, as much as I love her and as close as we are together. She doesn't even get over, she doesn't try. Because she knows that I have a sanctuary of my soul wherein nobody but my creator and myself commune. Nobody. Nobody at all. And there is where I do my best work. When I go to write a book, I retire into my sanctuary, lay out that book. Commune with my maker. Get instructions. When I come to an intersection in life and I don't understand which way to go, I go into my sanctuary. I ask for guidance and I always get it. Always. Always. Don't you see what a wonderful thing it is to have this system of immunity? Don't you see how unselfish it is? Your first duty is to yourself. Shakespeare's marvelous poetic lines... To thine own self be true, and it must follow as night to day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. Uh, I was thrilled to the marrow of my bones when I first read that. I have read it hundreds of times. I've repeated it thousands of times. Because how true it is that your first duty is to yourself. Be true to yourself. Protect your mind. Protect your inner consciousness. You self-discipline to... Take possession of your own mind and to direct it to the things you want and to keep it off the things you don't want. That's your prerogative. The, Im the Creator gave you that as the most important and precious gift of the Creator to mankind. And uh, you could do nothing less than show your appreciation by respecting that gift and using it. Make up a list of five traits of personality in connection with which you need self-discipline for improvement. I don't care how perfect you are. Uh, there's not a person in this class who couldn't sit down and if you really be honest with yourself and if you don't know the answers, get your wife to tell you. She'll tell you some of these things that you should get in this list. Or your husband. But maybe he'll do a good job too. Uh, maybe uh, some, in some cases you won't have to ask the husband. He'll tell you without it. <laughs> or the wife, vice versa. But to find out five things in your personality that you need to change and write them down. Now, uh, just, uh, just for the sake of experiment, right now, uh, right out in your mind, just mentally, the first one, number one. <laughs> Surely everybody in this room can think of one trait of personality that you'd like to change. You're not going to do anything about your defects until you take inventory of them and find out what they are. And get them on paper where you can see them. 
and then start in doing something about them. And after you uh, discover these five traits in connection with which you uh, need to use self-discipline for improvement, you start in immediately to develop the opposite of those traits. If you're uh, in the habit of not sharing your opportunities or your blessings with other people, start in sharing them, no matter how much it hurts. Start in where you are. If you are uh, greedy or anything of that sort, start in sharing. If you've been in the habit of uh, <clears throat> passing on a little gossip to somebody, stop that for all time to come. Just stop it and start passing on, uh, not gossip, but what? Right. Complimentary things. You'd be surprised why you see a man blossom out, he'll be a different person. If you start telling him about some of the things that you know are good about him. I don't rub it on too thick. If you do, he'll wonder what you're after. <laughs> uh, uh, be reasonable about it. When anybody walks up to me and shakes my hand and says, Napoleon Hill, I, want, I have always wanted to meet you. I appreciate so much the books that you read, and I just wanted to tell you that uh, I have found myself, I've been, I've been a success in my professional business, and I owe it all to think and grow rich or to the law of success. I know that that man is telling the truth because uh, I can tell by the way, the, the tone of his voice, the look in his eye, and the way he takes hold of my hand. And I appreciate it. Now, if he stood there and rubbed it on, out of proportion to what I deserve, I would know right away that he's getting ready for a touch <laughs> of some sort. So you do have to be, uh, you do have to use uh, discretion. Now then next, uh, make up a list of all the traits of personality of those nearest to you, which you believe need to be improved by self-discipline. Now you'll have a uh, known trouble at all making up that list. You can find that one very easily. <laughs> I want you to notice the difference, the difference as to the ease with which you find that, uh, carry out that transaction, and uh, the one where you're looking into your own life or traits of character that need to be changed. Uh, Self-examination is a very difficult thing. Did you know that? Very difficult. Because we, well, why? Why is it difficult? Because we are biased in our favor. We think that whatever we do, no matter how it turns out, if we did it, then it must be right. And if it doesn't turn out right, it was always the other fellow's fault, not ours. <laughs> always. Some of these days, I'm going to have somebody walk in and tell me that, and I, there are plenty of students who can do that, uh, walk in and tell me that they had been at odds with somebody for a long time only to find out when they got into this philosophy that the trouble was not with the other fellow, it was with themselves. And they started through self-discipline to improve themselves, and lo and behold, when they got their own house clear, the other fellow's house was also clean. And that's the way it'll work out. It's astounding as to how many motes you can see in the other fellow's eye when you're not looking for those in your own eye. I think that everybody, before he condemns anybody, should go in before a looking glass and say, Now look here, fellow. Uh, before you start condemning anybody, before you start uh, passing out gossip about anybody, I want, uh, you, you look yourself in the eye and uh, find out if you have clean hands. Remember that passage in the Bible? He was without sin among you. Let him cast the first stone. All right. Cast the first stone first before you commence condemning other people. And when you make a practice of that, you'll get to the point at which you can forgive people for almost anything. Next uh, there, what is the most important form of self-discipline which should be exercised by all who aspire to outstanding success? Well, now, what's the most important form of self-discipline? There's just one. It's outstanding. It control of thought. Well, of course, the control of your thoughts, the control of your mind. As a matter of fact, there's nothing else of importance in the world, is there, except the control of your mind. If you control your own mind, you'll control everything that you come into contact with. You really will. You'll never be the master of circumstances. You'll never be the master of the space that you occupy in the world until you first learn to be the master of your own mind. You will never will. Now, Mr. Gandhi, you've heard me speak of him many times in uh, biding his time to gain freedom of India, used uh, these five principles. Definiteness of purpose. He knew what he wanted. Applied faith. He began to do something about it by talking to his uh, fellow men, indoctrinating them with the same desire. He didn't do anything vicious. He didn't uh, commit any acts of uh, mayhem or murder. Then, third, by going the extra mile. And fourth, by forming a mastermind, the like of which this world probably has never seen before, with at least 200 millions of his fellow men all con 
contributing to that mastermind alliance, the main object being to free themselves from India without violence. And fifth, self-discipline on a scale without parallel in modern times. Now, there are the elements that made Mahatma Gandhi the master of the great British Empire. No doubt about it. Self-discipline. Where in the world would you find a man that would stand all of the things that Gandhi stood, all of the uh, insults, all of the uh, incarcerations that he went through while standing his ground and yet not striking back in time? He struck back on his own ground with his own weapons. And that's a very safe thing to do. Select your own, ba if you have to go to battle with somebody, select your own battleground, select your own weapons, and then if you don't win, uh, it's, up to, it's your own fault. <laughs> I want you to remember that. I want you to remember that because you're going to have battle to do in one way or another throughout life. You're going to have to plan campaigns to put yourself across, to remove opposition out of your way. You've got to be smarter than your opposition or your enemies. And the way to do it is not to strike back on battlegrounds of their choice with weapons of their choice, but to select your own battleground and your own weapons. Does that mean anything to you, what I'm just saying? I don't know how much it means to you now, but the time will come when it will mean something to you. When, you. when you've got a problem to solve, somebody's opposing you, you've got to go around somebody. Then you will think of this lecture that I delivered here tonight, wherein I said, choose your own battleground and choose your own weapons. Condition yourself first for the battle. By making up your mind that you're not under any circumstances going to try to destroy anybody or to do anybody any injury other than that of defending your own rights. And when you take that attitude, I want to tell you that you're just as good as one before you ever start. And I don't care who your adversary is, how much, how, st how strong he is, or how smart he is. If you use those tactics, you're bound to win. To create a system whereby you take full possession of your own mind and keep it occupied with all the things, circumstances, and desires of your choice and strictly off of the things you do not want. Now, how do you go about keeping your mind off of things you don't want? Will you tell me that? I want to see if you have a clear idea. Why, of course, that's, a, that's an elementary question. And I didn't mean to insult your intelligence by asking it. I only wanted to emphasize it by having you tell me. And I know that I don't have anything. I was not blessed with anything that you don't have, and maybe not half as much as some of you have. My background was certainly much more difficult than that of most of you. And if I made the grade, I know you can make it. But you'll have to take possession, you'll have to be in charge of your institution and your enterprise. And you are an institution, an enterprise, each one of you. You'll have to be in charge. You've got to call the shots and see that they're carried out. And you have to have self-discipline with which to do it. That's how you go about keeping your mind off the things you don't want, by occupying your mind and seeing in your imagination the things that you do want. Even, th even though you don't have physical possession of them, you can always have mental possession, don't you know? And unless you have mental possession of a thing first, you'll never have a physical possession of it. You may be sure of that, unless somebody wishes it upon you or it falls on you out of the top of a house when you're walking by accidentally. Anything that you get or acquire by desire must be created and gotten in your mental attitude first. And you must be very sure about it there. You must see yourself in possession of it, and that takes self-discipline. Now your reward for doing this is mastery of your own destiny through guidance of infinite intelligence. Isn't that a marvelous thing? A reward for doing this. For doing what? Taking possession of your own mind. It gives you direct contact with infinite intelligence. No doubt in the world about it. When I tell you that there's a person standing looking over my shoulder... And guiding me, I'm particularly telling you the truth when I meet with obstacles. I know I, all I have to do is to remember that he's right there. And if I come to an intersection of life, I don't know which way to turn, this way or that way, or to go ahead or to go back. All I have to do is to remember that that uh, invisible force is there looking over my shoulder and he'll always point the right direction if I pay attention to him and have faith in him. How would I know that that's true, do you think? How could I say that, make a statement like that, and know that it's true? Only one way, and that's by having practiced it. That's the only way I would know. And I certainly will never be guilty of telling you anything will happen unless I have made it happen, and unless I tell you how you can make it happen. 
Now, the penalty for not doing it, for not doing what? Not taking possession of your own mind, which is the penalty that the majority of people pay all the way through the life, is this. You will become the victim of the stray winds of circumstance, which will remain forever beyond your control. What, uh, what are the stray winds of circumstance? What am I talking about there, do you think? You'll become the victim of every influence that you come into contact with, enemies and everything else alike. All these things that you don't want will sway you like a leaf on the bosom of a wind unless you take possession of your own mind. That's the, uh, that's the penalty that you must pay. Isn't it a strange thing to, to contemplate? Isn't it a profound thing to recognize the truth that you have been given a means by which you can declare and determine your earthly destiny? And that along with that comes a penalty, and a, a, a tremendous penalty that you must pay if you don't embrace that asset and use it. And along with it also comes this tremendous asset, a reward that you do receive automatically if you accept that asset and use it. What a profound thing it is. If I didn't have any other evidence of a first cause or a creed, if I didn't have any other evidence than what I know about that principle, then I would know there had to be a first cause. Because that's too profound for any human being to think out. Giving you a great asset and then penalizing you for not accepting it, rewarding you if you do accept it. That's the sum and the substance of what happens when you use the self-discipline with which to take possession of your own mind and to direct it to the things you want. Never mind what you want. That's nobody's business except yours. Did you hear what I said then? You sure you heard it? That's nobody's business, what you want, but yours. I don't want you to forget that. Don't let anybody come along and sell you the idea that, uh, as to what you should want. Who's going to tell me what I want or what I should want? Yes, you bet your life. It hasn't always been that way, but it is that way today. There isn't anybody going to tell me what I want. I'll do that. And if I allowed anybody else to tell me, I'd think it was an insult to my creator because he intended that I should have the last word about this guy here. And believe you me, I take it. <laughs> I take it all the time. I don't hurt anybody else. And nobody else. I would do nothing in this world under any circumstances to injure anybody or anything. Whatever you do to or for another person, you do to or for yourself. It's an eternal law. Nobody can avoid or evade that law. That's why I wouldn't be a prosecuting attorney. That's why I was so proud that I didn't follow my inclination and become a lawyer. I had a long visit with my brother Vivian. He's a lawyer. And he practices, he specializes in divorce suits. Especially divorce suits of very wealthy people. <laughs> and uh, I want to tell you the penalty he's paid for knowing too much about the bad side of domestic relations. He got so much of that that he came to the conclusion all women were bad and he never married. He's never had the pleasure of a wife like I have because he thinks that all women are bad because he's judging them by the ones he knows best, which is a common trait of all of us. We judge people by the ones we know best, don't we? And it's not always fair either to do that. Certainly not in his case. I'm calling to your attention some of the vital things in life that you need to deal with. You need to understand yourself and understand people and understand how to adjust yourself in, uh, with people that are difficult to get along with. You need to know that, because there are a lot of people in this world that are difficult to get along with, and there are going to be a lot as long as you and I live, and long after that. So we can't uh, do away with those people that are difficult to get along with, but we can do something about it by doing something with ourselves. Does that make sense to you all or not? Yes. I think it does. 